With chess being more popular than ever, I thought I'd share a period of chess history where our beloved game was used as political propaganda, a metric to gauge intellectual and cultural superiority, a battleground between two nations both fighting for their own ideologies, when national heroes were bred and those who couldn't conform to a certain legislate were imprisoned tortured and even exiled, and our one man destroyed the entire country's decades long dominance and changed the game of chess forever. Hi, I'm Donny and welcome to my channel. This is the most dangerous period in chess history. The cold war was an odd time to say the least. It was a period of heavy political and military tension between two of the world's superpowers, the USA and Russia, known as the Soviet Union. From 1947 to 1991, they were competing to prove their superiority as the number one country in the world, in areas ranging from who had the biggest guns, who had the best technology, the superior ideology, space exploration, and believe it or not, a board game. See, chess has always been seen as the game to prove your intellectual and strategic dominance. So having the best chess players in the world means that your country has a competitive edge. And this is where our story starts. Back in 1924, the Soviet Union saw the potential that chess had and how it was the embodiment of their revolutionary ideal. In comes Nikolai Krylenko, Russia's chairman of chess. He was tasked to make chess the Soviet Union's national sport and create the entire culture around the game of 64 squares. In the years that followed, Krylenko and the Soviet Union poured an ungodly amount of resources into chess, creating a colossal infrastructure and gathering a pool of millions of young chess players. The life of a professional chess player in the Soviet Union was a privileged one too, with the Soviets making their salaries much higher than the average wage, allowing travel to different countries all over the world and awarding the honor of Lenin to the best chess players they had, the highest honor a civilian can achieve, all to further to push young players to take chess seriously. So by the time the Cold War started in 1947, the Russians have already produced the entire generation of literal chess terminators, ready to destroy any country standing in their way, crushing the English in a team match 18-6 and destroying the Americans 15-5. In the period leading up to the Cold War, saw hundreds of young Soviets reaching the level of master and grandmaster. To this day, Russia has produced more masters in the game of chess than any other country, having more masters than the second, third, and fourth place combined. One of the Russian players issued a warning to the West, saying they would bury any country trying to stand against them. And in 1948, Mikhail Botnik, part of the first generation of Terminators, I mean chess masters to come out of the Soviet Union, secured their dominance by beating the top 5 grand masters in a tournament and in the same year becoming the world chess champion. Botnik was a national hero and the first Soviet chess superstar. What followed was a two decade long domination of the game of chess, with nobody coming close to them. In this period, the Soviet school of chess had raised the game to a higher level in both strategy and tactic. For an astonishing 20 years, every match to determine the world chess champion was played by two Soviets in the Soviet Union. There was no sign of their dominance on the chessboard being broken anytime soon. But all was not well in the culture they were making, because those who did not want to conform to the communist Soviet Union and their way of doing things were seen as traitors and faced the full wrath of the Soviet government. Left with few choices, most decided to run and escape from Russia, seeking shelter in other countries. Such was the case of Viktor Korchnoi, who played twice for the world championship after settling in Switzerland. Most were met with much more harsh and brutal treatment. A lot of this far too graphic and straight up horrific to share on here, but one of them was that of Ludek Pakman. In 1968, when he turned anti-communist, he was dragged to the torture cellar in the middle of the night, where they continued to torture him to the point where he tried to take his own life just to escape the horrible treatment he was receiving. By the mid-1970s, the USA had already started showing their superiority in most areas of the Cold War, and soon they will give their first real showing in chess too. Enter America's greatest chess player, and the guy who changed the game forever, Bobby Fischer. Fischer was a 29-year-old chess phenom, a 12-time US champion, and at the time a record holder for becoming the youngest grandmaster at the age of just 15. In 1963, he went on to win 11 out of 11 games in the US Chess Championship tournament. 
it. A record that still has not been met to this day. The whole world wanted to see the American take on the powerhouse that was the Soviet Union's border Spassky. And in 1972, that's exactly what happened. The World Chase Championship match between Bobby Fischer and Boris Spassky would be the moment the US challenged the Soviets in their own sport. A sport they have been dominating for the past two decades. This match would go on to become the match that would change chess forever. This clash between the two strongest chess players of the time would be used as a major propaganda for both countries and be seen as a proxy battle between the capitalist America and a communist Russia. It would attract over 50 million people around the world to watch the battle that took place on the chessboard, with Fischer even saying publicly that he would crush them and their entire institution. But even before the match started, Bobby Fischer would go to war with the entire world, making the match that would end up changing the life of all future chess players, demanding the match be hosted in a neutral country, and not in Russia for the first time since 1948, also threatening not to play because the prize money was too low, saying that the players deserved more than they were receiving. The man wanted to get paid and was not willing to budge. This would lead to an 8 month long battle pushing the prize pool to a whopping $1.7 million. This amount was more than all previous world championship matches put together and there would never again be a chess world championship match with a prize pool less than $1 million. And finally, after 8 months, in August of 1972, two players went to war on the 64 squares. The battle for world champion was the best out of 24 and Fischer came out victorious, beating Spassky 12.5 to 8.5, crowning him the new king of chess. The USA used this as a major propaganda to deal a massive blow to the Soviet Union's reputation as the number one chess country in the world. A hit that would leave huge psychological effects on the Soviets. Boris Pesky would choose to go into voluntary exile after the loss to Fischer and escape the Soviet regime and many of the time would mark this as the beginning of the end of the Cold War. A period of chess that was more about ideologies and politics off the board than talent and skill on it. Thanks for watching, I hope you guys enjoyed the video, please don't forget to drop a like and subscribe to my channel. Bye!